l'honorable député de Vaudreuil-Soulanges. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I'll be sharing my time with the Honourable Member for Don Valley North. Je me lève aujourd'hui dans cette chambre pour parler d'un sujet de grande importance. Toute occasion de prendre la parole dans ce lieu est sacrée. C'est un privilège de ne pas prendre à la légère, surtout lorsque nous sommes appelés ici pour parler d'une période difficile pour le Canada et pour tous ceux qui appellent notre pays leur chez soi. C'est ce qui se fait aujourd'hui, Madame la Présidente, et je prends la parole pour affirmer ma conviction que déclarer une urgence d'ordre public en vertu de la loi sur les mesures d'urgence était nécessaire pour faire face aux menaces multiformes et coordonnées qui présentent actuellement sur notre sécurité, notre démocratie et notre économie. Madam Speaker, my constituents and Canadians and communities all across Canada are by this point aware of the self-titled Freedom Convoy that descended on the city of Ottawa over three weeks ago to, in their own words, end the COVID-19 mandates now. As someone who openly welcomes opposing views, lively debates, and who has participated in dozens of protests and demonstrations myself over my lifetime, I supported their right to do so. This right is, in fact, entrenched in Section 2B of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. It protects the ability for citizens to voice their discontent, question authority, and to seek change. It is something that is the core of who we are as a people, and as an MP, a proud Canadian, I will always fight to defend it. However, in our democracy, freedom of expression is not absolute. Section 2B extends toward lawful, peaceful protest. The Charter does not protect illegal blockades and occupations. Far from seeing people exercising their constitutional rights to disagree vigorously with the government, we have instead seen intimidation, threats, harassment, and an attack on our ability to produce and trade goods. Madam Speaker, we have seen a coordinated effort by outside actors to attack our country's right to make its own decision and chart its own path. First, let me begin by addressing what has occurred here in Ottawa. The protest began over COVID-19 mandates and restrictions. And over the course of three weeks, it had morphed into an occupation of a city that almost one million Canadians call home. Streets were blocked. Engines ran 24 hours a day, making the air difficult to breathe for neighboring residents, and horns sounded at all hours of the night with what many in Ottawa, seniors, parents, and students alike have called a form of sleep deprivation torture. Frequent and unabated displays of hatred, including swastikas, Confederate flags, signs proudly stating pure blood, and acts of direct hatred when windows were smashed at local businesses because they posted signs on their windows that represented differing points of views. We have seen the desecration of our national monuments, including our national war memorial and an attempted arson, all of which, Madam Speaker, was caught on video. Prior to this weekend, efforts by the Ottawa police to maintain law and order in the nation's capital were unsuccessful, resulting in both the city and Ottawa and the Conservative government of Ontario declaring a state of emergency. But all of this is but one component of a much larger and more coordinated effort to undermine, undermine our institutions and our economy, Madam Speaker. There's also been coordinated efforts to block our national border crossings, halt the flow of goods and people, and stop trade. Blockades have occurred in Surrey, Emerson, and Coots, Alberta. They have in occurred in the Ambassador Bridge in Windsor, Ontario. These are deliberate attacks, Madam Speaker, targeting critical infrastructure. And as the chairperson of the Standing Committee on Transport, Infrastructure and Communities, I heard witness testimony just this last Thursday, February 17th, that these ports of entry blockades have resulted in trade disruptions costing Canada $3.9 billion, Madam Speaker. $400 million in daily losses at the Windsor Crossing alone. With automotive parts, for example, no longer able to make their way to factories, Shifts at multiple auto plants were cancelled and thousands of workers were sent home. All of this, Mr. S Madam Speaker, impacting businesses and workers and the confidence in Canada as a reliable trading partner and a safe place to invest. Adding to this, Madam Speaker, in the United States and indeed in other nations, foreign citizens and bodies with their own interests have openly supported the blockades and admitted to sending money and resources to help the blockades continue. In fact, it has now come to light that over 50% of all the donations received through the convoy's online fundraising campaign were American, including American billionaires who donated upwards of $90,000 themselves alone. I ask anyone watching who hears this, 
whether it is acceptable for any foreign actors or foreign citizens to contribute to efforts to undermine the democratic process of another country, or for that matter, purposefully sabotage the economic trade routes of another country through blockades. Blockades, I repeat, Madam Speaker, that cost $3.9 billion in economic activity for Canadians. And I ask members of this House, particularly my honourable colleagues and friends from across the aisle, what is their threshold? Is this not enough? What is their threshold before they adopt the necessary measures to counter those who seek to undermine the decisions of this House and, more importantly, the will of Canadians at large? Adding to this, just a few days ago, the Anti-Defamation League showed a result of their study of the online Give, Send, Go fundraising campaign. And it found, Madam Speaker, that roughly 1,100 people in the United States who supported the January 6th insurrection last year that stormed the U.S. Capitol were donors of the blockades here in Canada. Je demande à tous les Canadiens qui nous écoutent présentement et j'implore les membres de cette Chambre de réfléchir à ces faits, Madame la Présidente, et de réfléchir profondément. En tant que député et membre de cette Chambre, nous pouvons au moins tous convenir que ces actions sont inacceptables et qu'un geste concerté doit être entrepris pour faire face à cette affront à notre démocratie. De plus, les honorables collègues de cette Chambre et tous les Canadiens qui nous regardent en ce moment devraient être alarmés par les résultats des 13 arrestations effectuées à la frontière de Coutts en Alberta la semaine dernière, où ils ont trouvé un important cachet d'armes à feu de calibre militaire, des munitions et des gilets par bail qui ont donné lieu à des accusations de complot en vue de commettre un meurtre. Des mesures, Madame la Présidente, devaient être prises. Des mesures pour protéger nos institutions démocratiques, pour protéger nos frontières et notre économie, pour répondre aux besoins de la ville d'Ottawa et la province d'Ontario et de toute autre province qui demande de l'aide à la suite des blocages coordonnés. Pour ces raisons, je voterai en faveur de l'adoption de la loi sur les mesures d'urgence. Madam Speaker, to address misconceptions and concerns regarding overreach, I want to reaffirm that this is not the invocation of the War Measures Act. We are not calling in the military. What we are doing, Madam Speaker, is giving the RCMP the power to enforce local laws and work quickly and efficiently with local law enforcement. We are not putting the RCMP or any other police force under the direct control of the government, Madam Speaker. Policing operational decisions remain independent under this Act, as they should and must in any strong democracy. This Act also directs financial institutions to take action to halt the funding of illegal blockades of our ports and border crossings and levy significant penalties. And to address concerns relating to charter rights infringements, I want to share five key steps, checks and regulations built into the Act, and speak to the important role of the Attorney General of Canada. First. Everything done by a government under the Emergency Act must be done in accordance with the Charter, full stop. It is entrenched in the preamble of the Act. Second, all declarations are time limited to 30 days, and in fact, it may be less, and I hope that it will be less. Third, the very act of declaring an emergency under the Declaration must be reviewed by a committee of all members of Parliament and Senators from all political parties. Fourth, the exercise of powers under the Declaration must be reviewed by that committee. And finally, following the end of an emergency, a full inquiry must be held. Enfin, Madame la Présidente, le Procureur général du Canada, un compatriote québécois, représentant la circonscription voisine de la salle Emmaur Verdun, est un avocat de longue date. Il était vice-doyen du département de droit à l'Université de McGill. Il était un homme qui a le respect des députés de tous les agences politiques et pour tâche de veiller à ce que les droits des Canadiens en vertu de la Charte soient protégés et que toutes les mesures nécessaires et cruciales soient prises conformément à la loi. J'ai confiance en ses capacités et son caractère. J'ai confiance dans la capacité de cette Chambre et de tous les députés à faire en sorte que les mesures prévues par cette loi soient utilisées de façon mesurée et seulement quand et où cela est nécessaire pour mettre fin à ces attaques et blocages. C'est sûr que mes concitoyens de Vaudreuil et Soulanges et tous les Canadiens attendent de nous, et c'est sûr que nous devons maintenant faire ensemble. Merci, Madame la Présidente.